Hi, this is Annie Fox for Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. My guest today is Rosalind Wiseman. Rosalind says that she's only had one job since graduating from college to help communities shift the way we think about children and teens' emotional and physical well-being. As a teacher, thought leader, author, and media spokesperson on bullying, ethical leadership, the use of social media, and media literacy, she's in constant dialogue and collaboration with educators, parents, children, and teens. Rosalind's the author of Queen Bees and Wannabes, the groundbreaking best-selling book that was the basis for the feature film, Mean Girls. Hi, Rosalind. Welcome to Family Confidential. Hi. It is so good to see you and talk to you. I know. It's been a couple of years, right? Yeah, it has so, been. Yeah, and a lot has happened. Um, and I know that you're working on a new curriculum about culture. And wow, what perfect timing. Here we are in the run-up up to the 2016 presidential election, and uh, words matter. So I want to—I really want to talk to you about what kids are hearing, how they're processing it, and what you're, you're seeing and hearing on the ground in schools from students and parents. Yeah, like when I was rewriting Owning Up, I had no idea. I had no idea how this was going to be so relevant for what we're dealing with today. Um, I just knew that I needed to update, you know, the work that I do so that it's, it's as good as teachers and students deserve. Um, I just, I just had no idea. So we, you know, I really, it's important, I think, for us to say that it's always, always critical for us to be taking things about how social culture impacts kids at school because it is absolutely common sense, but research shows that the way in which kids treat each other and feel about being at school impacts their ability to do well in school and to feel like they're welcome there and feel like somebody's invested in their education. So, you know, at first I redid this curriculum because I work with kids and I work in schools, but it's gotten so much bigger now um, because of just the vitriol and the nastiness and the racism and the sexism and the xenophobia that we regularly are hearing and our young people are regularly hearing. And not only that, but I just came back from a conference yesterday um, in Austin, Texas with middle school teachers, and many of them were asking me, what do I do? What do I do with this increase of nastiness that I'm seeing from boys to other kids of, of color or to girls, and then they're justifying it from what they're seeing in the media? Do I get to say anything? Because if I say something, does that mean that I'm like endorsing one candidate over another? And you know, I think this is lost this is nothing about who you choose as a candidate. This is about what common decency is about and what we stand for as a community. And we cannot tolerate people being xenophobic and racist and sexist. And that's what you focus on as a teacher. Yeah, you know, Teaching Tolerance out of the Southern Poverty Law Center um, did an extensive study um, and they were, they were surveying classroom teachers and they came up with something that they, they named the Trump effect where where students were reporting to teachers, students of color and, um, and immigrants, were reporting to their teachers that they were feeling less safe, anxious, fearful to go to school because of the increase of this kind of vitriol that you're talking about. So it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And you know, I've been teaching for so long, and there's always been a couple of kids who feel that they have sort of the right to be incredibly obnoxious and hurtful. Um, and they're sort of on the long road to being decent human beings. But I mean, for the most part, I think that they are going to get there. But there's always been a group of like small minority of kids who feel that they just have the right to insult and offend kids. And they just say it's funny. And, you know, really what's been incredible about that and what I think is really frightening to me, but one that I really think we need to address and even work harder for is that those kids are clearly emboldened by what's happening and that they can dismiss anything you say by saying you're being politically correct, you can't. Now, I've been dealing with that stuff in middle schools and high schools for as long as I've been teaching, but they clearly are emboldened to keep saying it and to ha feel like they have more and more um, confidence to keep doing it. And the thing that really scares me is that teachers don't feel that they can say anything because some of them have been instructed to not say anything at all about the election. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not about who you vote for. It's about how we conduct ourselves during the election. That is a completely different thing. Now, one of the people in the election is racist, xenophobic, and uh, um, and just and says horrible things about people all the time. Then people can draw their own conclusions about that. But young people need these kinds of standards. They need adults in their life saying, "You can't, you cannot do this in civil society." 
Yeah, and, and you know, it's also true. Studies have shown that when teachers um, sit back and say nothing, that in fact promotes, in, in, indirectly promotes more of the same behavior. So when teachers come to you and say, I, I feel like my hands are tied here, um, how, yeah. how do you help them um, mm -hmm. navigate those waters and in fact do their job right. as character educators inside right. the classroom? Well, you know, first of all, I think it's really important to, to 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 really specify for core curriculum teachers, teachers who teach math and Spanish and, you know, science, those kinds of things, that they are social emotional learning educators, that they don't, you don't have to have a book or a curriculum, you know, to be teaching and teaching all day, every day, these, these things, that you as a math teacher can have these moments in the classroom that you stand up for stuff. I have to tell you, my brother... As a high school teacher um, in Catonsville, Maryland, for Catonsville High School, and he just got a letter that I was so proud of from a mom saying that he had that she was thanking him for saying um, allowing kids to be homophobic in the classroom. And not only did he get a letter from the mom, but shortly thereafter he got a letter from from her daughter. And she described she's not gay herself, but she described what it what it was like because she was so pained for various reasons of the amount of homophobia that was happening in the classroom. And to have my brother say, This is not what we're gonna do in this classroom, this is not what we stand for, not only did it make her feel that the classroom was safe, but it made her feel like there was an adult who actually was going to stand for morality and ethics. And if we understand that directly connects to young people's engagement in school and their performance in school, then we have lost our minds. So it is clear, 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 and all the research shows, it's common sense, that core curriculum teachers can do this. And that's what I do, and that's what I'm hoping to do with this new whole way of doing this curriculum, is being able to do it in really innovative and flexible ways for all different kinds of teachers. Yeah, I think what you said is wonderful. I really thank you for sharing what your brother did that takes so courage oh, yeah so really proud. yay bro yeah. uh, um it it really for for kids you know i i agree with you there have always been a minority of kids who who feel empowered to to cross the line whether they're doing it as attention seekers whether they're mimicking something that that they're hearing at home and or whether they're they're just um feeling that this for whatever reason, I don't like this kid, this group of people, and I'm socially powerful enough to be able to say it with, with impunity. But, but here's the thing. If, if there are no, if there's no pushback from a teacher, all the other kids, the 90 or 95% of the kids who are uncomfortable in that moment hearing that, they, they feel on really shaky grounds. There, there's no leadership here. They don't feel strong enough to be able to say it, so they do look to the teacher. Yeah, and there. I mean, really, what is emboldened in that moment is is the ability for a few people to be horrible to other people, yeah. and we don't need more kids thinking that adults are morally weak. I mean, it's a horrible thing to say, but it's really true that young people oftentimes do not see the role modeling that they need, and we always talk about adults being role models, but we actually have to acknowledge and admit that our young people see adults who don't say anything a lot. And that's the role model. The role right. model is that's keep your mouth shut. Seeing exactly. And then they get mad at kids, you know, or like sort of disbelief, like sort of surprised and shocked when kids see something in a school hallway or anywhere and they don't do anything. Exactly. And it's just like, well, why didn't you do anything? Well, geez, have you shown me any way of doing this in a realistic way? Oh, well, no, yeah. I haven't seen it. I've I, seen you look the other way. I've seen you try and laugh it off. I've seen you, you know, watch adults in the school abuse power and bully other people, and you don't do anything about it. Now, it's really tricky. I'm not saying those, those situations aren't incredibly tricky, but we have to recognize the consequences of that when we do that. Yeah, really well said. Um, so we think about role modeling as a positive thing, but the truth is you may be role modeling something very, yeah, very absolutely. ineffective and, um, and, and something that it's not a direction we want our kids to go in. So most of my listeners and viewers are parents. If, if parents um, get wind of the fact that um, this kind of targeting is happening either to their children or around their children, what steps can parents take? Well, I think that there's, you know, there's lots of that you, people might think this is crazy because I mean, truly, and and if you do, I get it, I guess, but I don't really. Which is that, um, you know, I think we see small um, injustices 
a lot and we sometimes we don't notice that we don't want to notice them. So I'm going to just talk about something that's actually really, for some people, really small or they'd be like, this is crazy. And actually, I just realized I'm about to say this to you. This is not funny or ironic, but um, I think the kids are teasing each other about being ginger and about being redheaded a lot right now. And I, there's been a huge increase in what I see from kids about their um, freedom to just go after kids like that. And you know how you get teased and you get teased and you get teased about something that you have like no control over and you can't say anything about it. And if you say anything about it and they just pile on you even more, I think that that even in, um, I've been noticing in the last couple of years that that increase of just this kind of license to go after kids who have red hair is really increasing. And I would ask, there's not, of course, maybe the history that we're talking about with race, but you know, in some ways, there are some very large similarities here. It's an inherent thing that you have, and somebody thinks they can just go after you about it. And if you see that with kids, you know, sort of, you're thinking, oh, it's just a color. I don't know if I agree with that. And I think that for kids who are redheaded, who are get teased this way, the other part is, is that they're like, oh, I don't care. It doesn't, you know. Sometimes they'll say, like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know. Don't worry about it. But that's what they have to say. And so it's really difficult to know, do they really not, you know, if they don't like it or if they do like it. And the reason I'm saying this is is I've seen it with my sons, that they tease their friends who are redheaded. And they have been incredibly insensitive to the boys. And I've seen, because the first time I absolutely was like, you need to stop that right now. And there are like seven boys on the couch and all that. And the kid who was redheaded said, you know, I don't mind, I don't care. And I said, hey, I'm going to tell you. I don't want it. And, I, and it was my boys. Let's be really clear here. It was my boys who were the ones that were saying the obnoxious stuff. So I, and it's not the only conversation I'm having with them about this because it's not like they listen to me once or like I say it once and they like change their behavior. That's not going to happen. I'm going to have to do this like 25 times. And I want parents to realize that our kids are quite capable. Like most of our children are quite capable of saying things that are horrifying. And you might look at your kid and say, oh, my gosh, what a great kid. And he is a great kid. I'm not taking away, like, great kid. Those great kids can say some pretty racist and insensitive things. Or they can look at something happening, like a kid being racist or sexist or whatever, and not do anything about it. So So, we have to admit that. Yeah, you have to admit it. And and I think that that your story about about your sons and, and, and their friends and the reaction of the kid with the red hair is is really interesting because... I, I, I'm I guessing there's something about the group dynamic there that gives all of those boys on the couch more license to do what they know is not cool. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I wrote about that a lot in Masterminds and, you know, it, and it's, it's, it, you know, the group dynamics are powerful where what, what is the, you know, there's usually a role in a group of boys um, that the boys I work with call the punching bag role, role, and the kids feel that they can go after him. And they feel like, well, nobody else can tease him, but we can tease him. And so it gives them license to just, you know, just constantly, constantly rip on each, on that one kid. What I say to boys and girls about group dynamics and the teasing kind of stuff is that if there's sort of... Um, if there's like a democracy of teasing, like everybody can tease each other equally um, and listen to each other and stop when they've gone over the line, then that's cool. Like, I'm not going to fight and fuss with you about that. But if you have a group where only one or two people are being relentlessly pounded on and they and, they're, and then if they say something about it, um, you just tease them even more, then that's not acceptable. And I don't even care what it's about because it could be about anything, but that is not acceptable. And those group dynamics can be very powerful in that kind of constant ridicule. Yeah. And so parents observing this kind of behavior um, at home in a carpool, um, sidelines on a, on a game that they're, you know, it's like <sighs> the parent choice at that moment is, do I make a scene? Um, mm-hmm. Do I keep my mouth shut? Mm-hmm. Um, do I do the boys will be boys thing, girls will be girls? Yeah. Do I have a yeah. private conversation with my kid yeah. afterwards? But as you say, one private conversation is not necessarily going to change behavior. In my work, I, when I talk about the group dynamic, I also um, acknowledge that it's it's pretty challenging for that uh, sure. 9, 10, or 15-year-old kid to stand up at that moment in the group and say, hey, guys. Yeah. 
Let's stop. So, absolutely. I mean, what I do um, is I, what I think is usually the most helpful, but at the same time, understanding that this kind of stuff can be very hard to know how to do in the moment. Mm-hmm. But the great thing about parenting is you're going to have like countless opportunities <laughs> to practice this stuff. But when it happens in the moment, um, I usually say something. Um, and But that's, you know, I'm used to sort of as a teacher, I'm sort of used to that, but that's sort of parenting, teaching sort of happening at the same time. But I will say something to the boys like, hey, with that kind of voice, yeah. hey, that needs to stop right now. And if I hear anything about but whatever, I'm like, that's so not happening. And I keep going and I keep going. But I lay like down, I say something that lays down like that's not how ha- it's not going to happen. And then what I do is I follow up with my kid or frankly, I feel pretty close to the kids that my my kids are, are friends with. Like I have a rule that if you eat chips in my like out of my house, you are my child. <laughs> and so, and so like, I get a lot of people are here all the time eating my food. So I mean I absolutely will tell other I will tell other kids. You know, one of my my youngest son has um, a best friend who needs a little help in this area. And so I will talk to him about this kind of stuff, not long drawn out things. I will talk to him for a minute and actually, and I, oh, and sometimes there've been times like where I had him actually listen to a podcast about something because he was having dinner with us and we were all going to have a conversation about consent based on we all listen to a podcast. This is what we were doing as a family that night. We do not do that every day, but we do do it sometimes. And he was going to come over for dinner. So I told his parents that that's what we were doing. Um, now the child, of course, like runs for me whenever I like threaten him with podcasts, but that's like bonding. That's bonding. Cause he knows that I care. I truly knows that yes, I'm annoying as his friend's mother, but I actually care about his brain and I can be part of our family. We do things like that. And that's important to me. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the old takes a village thing. Um, we're all villagers here. And, right. and, and I agree with you. The, the, the kid eats chips in my house. He's my kid. You're under right. my roof, my and child. and right. and you're you're exposed to my values, right. and and so it come it 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 comes from you to them. It it also comes maybe indirectly through your children to their friends. Right. And the thing so, that I sometimes you know about race stuff is that. You know, I, for me, as a mom, I have two teenage boys, you know, I have two teenage boys, they're 15 and 13. And, you know, because they are that age, they can so easily appropriate this kind, you know, the kinds of stuff they see in the media, like in their selfies and those kinds of things. And I've talked to them, they know a lot about racial appropriation, cultural appropriation, they know, they know a lot. They would say that they're bored to death with the things that I talk to them about. But it still doesn't stop them sometimes from taking pictures like where they've seen that, where they look much, much tougher than they are, right? And, um, and I've had, and then again, you have these conversations about how, like, why are you doing this? Why is it important to you to look like this? Why is it important for you to show the world that this is who you are? I don't expect them to change right away. What I expect them to do is just to hold that question and then think about it later. But does it, but are there, for example, as a parent, are there pictures of my children looking not in ways that I think is awesome? Absolutely. And, but it's a process of having them learn what the media is doing to them, how they're identifying and developing as young men, why they're choosing these things, and then what does it say about them to the larger world? Yeah. What does it say? How do you want to present yourself? Who are you really? And, and at what price do you project this, this image that isn't you? Yes. Um, how much energy does it take to keep that in place? Yeah, what, is it, what does it say to, um, to young women that are friends of yours? Yeah. Yes. Or yes. I mean, there's many, uh, there are many, like th- that, that's actually a way that I will stop. So if I see something, I, there, like it happened last week when my kid took a picture of himself for Snapchat and right before he posted it, I, I happened to say to him, so if your godmother said that, he was African American, how would you feel about that? And he looked at me and he deleted the picture. Now, here's the trick, though, and it's really difficult for me. It's really difficult. You don't have another conversation. You don't follow the conversation up at that moment. If he actually did something, right, that affirms that you said something that's sort of truthful to him, yeah. you don't want to say more words. No, you no, just no. let it go, right? Right. <laughs> it's very tempting as a parent to just oh, yeah. 
Uh, and as a and teacher it, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just never ever worked. So you know, it's important. You know, I have to say, like, I'm I was stunned, and and I think it's really important for parents to say to teachers around the country right now that I don't want you to say who. You know, I get it that we say to kids, we're not telling kids who to vote for if they can vote. That's not what we're doing. But what I want you to do as a teacher is it's really important to me that you share with kids that our values are that we are inclusive to people and we don't demean people based on gender and ethnicity and religion and all right and race. And so I would really love it if parents actually called and emailed the principals and the teachers and said this, because if we don't, then teachers and principals don't think that they that you have their support. And so then they get really nervous and then they don't say anything. So they're not most, I mean, like very few people aren't doing this because they don't care. It's because they're really frightened. And that's awful. We are, if we are too frightened to be talking and taking a stand against racism and homophobia, all of these things to our kids in schools, I mean, like truly, we've really got to like change because the way we're thinking about this, because those kids that are being this way, they're feeling even more confident. So we have to do this. Um, I'm working with teachers right now and parents all around the country, you know, trying to figure out how to implement these sort of lesson plans or little tiny little lesson segments into classes so that teachers feel more confident that they can do that and then go teach their science class. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, okay, we have about a minute left, Rosalind, and I'd love for you to give our listeners and viewers an opportunity to find out where on the web they can learn more about your work. Oh, sure. Okay. So culturesofdignity.com is my website. Um, but what's, we also have, um, I, I have right here, I do this. Ah, very proud. This is like the kids and I, middle school students, I worked on this together. Oh, and it just came out a couple days ago. So I mean, about a week ago. So I'm so proud of what we did. Um, and so that's, you can get that from Cultures of Dignity and you can also go to our website called owningup.online and it's not just a curriculum, it's really a community of teachers working together to figure out how to put these things into schools. This is what we need and you know, this, this, this social emotional intelligence, uh, skill building, <laughs> yes, one teacher said to me, oh, don't give me something more on my plate. This is the plate, right? Right. This, this is, is the plate. plate. Are you like it or not? This is the plate. This is the Everything plate. Everything else so goes on top of this. Right. right. Exactly. So thank, thank you very much for the work you do, Rosalind. Um, it's, it's an honor to talk to you always and a pleasure thank to know you. you. Thank you, Annie. This is Annie Fox for Family Confidential. To learn more about my work with tweens, teens, and their parents, visit AnnieFox.com. And check out my parenting book, Teaching Kids to Be Good People. And my latest book for tween girls, the girls' Q&A book on friendship. And please, rate us on iTunes. It helps other folks find the show. Family Confidential Podcast is produced by Electric Egg Plant, creators of books and apps for parents, kids, tweens, and teens. And tune in next time when my guest will be parenting coach Chester Hall. Chester and I will be talking about parenting through the teen years. Until then, happy parenting. <laughs>